So the Oscar nominations have come and gone, and there were some clear omissions in my opinion. Sandman won nothing and was recognized for nothing for his role in Uncut Gems. I disagree. Willem Dafoe, as expected, was completely snubbed with The Lighthouse only managing to pick up a cinematography nod, which I imagine only happened because the Oscars' hard-on for black and white surpasses their hatred of horror movies. Aquafina was sorely missed in that Best Actress category, and The Farewell as a whole was just completely neglected. I can think of at least four other directors who were extremely worthy of that best director slot. And I know that France essentially shot it in the foot by choosing to send Les Miserables as their submission for the Oscars, but Portrait of a Lady on Fire could have taken so many nominations across just about every nomination category had they actually chosen to submit that one, but it's okay. Celine's just gonna go chill with the Criterion Collection and not have to get caught up into this campaign fight. But there was another nomination that many people expected to see in the Best Supporting Actress category that was just completely missing. Let's talk about that. So Hustlers was kind of one of the bigger surprises this year. I know a lot of people didn't like it, but for the most part, people were genuinely surprised at how good a job it did weaving the story of these people. It made $157 million worldwide. Showed you another unexpected angle of the effects of the 2008 recession and the market crash on other businesses. And let the entire world know that JLo might be 50, but holy shit, does she look better than any of us. She's doing things I couldn't do in my wildest dream, like she's a college girl when she's my mother's age. What if somebody called the cops and says what Woo! i spent five thousand dollars at a strip club send help anyways the movie's mostly been well received and was honestly buzzing for some awards talk it kind of been picking up some steam in some of the smaller areas but the specific conversation largely was around lopez and her performance as the ramona character but then award season kind of started rolling around and nominations for the movie as a whole were a little bit lacking while she did manage to secure the nomination at the golden globes what once seemed like a shoo-in for at least a nomination at the oscars was just not there. Now I've been saying all year that 2019 is one of the best years that we've ever had for film. There is a ton of competition and Hustlers just might genuinely not be something that the Academy typically puts its stock behind compared to a lot of the other choices that they had. And some of that might come down to the studios not doing a good enough job rebranding themselves as like a serious contender for the Oscars when it went to awards season. Lopez herself is just genuinely seen as an overall celebrity rather than somebody who's typically taken as a serious actress. But there's another reason why they might not have campaigned campaign for Hustlers quite as hard as they might have otherwise. So one of the things the New Year brought was the fact that there was a massive lawsuit coming out against Jennifer Lopez's film production company that was being brought forward by the real-life Ramona, Samantha Barbish. The lawsuit itself is for $40 million and claims that the filmmakers proceeded to tell her story without gaining permission. And that's not to say they didn't try. According to Barbash, she was approached with an offer for $6,000 to gain the full rights to her story if she accepted. And honestly, offering $6,000 for that seems insultingly low when you're you're making a movie with Jennifer Lopez and Julia Stiles and a slew of other well-known actresses, performers, and entertainers. That 6K also apparently included a request to be interviewed by the filmmakers and that interview would have been presented at the end of the film. Allegedly, two other people accepted this exact same deal, but they didn't end up getting featured in the movie. And it's because of this that Barbash's lawyer is actually asserting that there's a chance that they basically sent this offer for $6,000 to be included so that they could just kind of shove in the release for the story itself within that $6,000 offer. Offer, specifically saying that it was a ruse to get people to sign away their rights. But the screenplay itself is based off the feature written by Jessica Pressler, who was the uh, real life person behind the character that Julia Stiles ended up playing, who in the movie is named Elizabeth. And the feature, of course, mirrored the story we see in the movie. It's a story about former strippers who conned wealthy clients through the use of drugs and alcohol, a scheme orchestrated by Barbash herself. These Wall Street guys, you see what they did to this country? They stole from everybody. Hardworking people lost everything. And not one of these douchebags went to jail. In the movie, Barbash is replaced with the character of Ramona. There are a couple differences, including the fact that in the film, Ramona has a daughter instead of a son. But Barbash claims the differences were not distinct enough to her own likeness and story to make it usable. So the lawsuit goes on to claim that the movie defamed her and their use of her story and likeness without gaining her permission. And she's not only looking for 40 million in punitive and compensatory damages, but she also wants every copy of the movie pulled and rendered to them. That's intense. That's very intense. Now, Barbara says she has no specific ill will to J-Lo herself and would just hope that J-Lo would respect the fact that she just wants to be fairly compensated for her inspiration to this story and just essentially get what she deserves and hopes that as a businesswoman, J-Lo would understand that. So obviously, I'm not a lawyer. I have no idea what kind of legal grounds you actually have here. I know that it's not uncommon for people to be upset with how they're portrayed in biopics and things that are based off of real stories and how 
obviously, if you make a movie based off one person's book, that could just tell their story. And then there's an entire separate story from the opposing side that might counter a lot of what they're saying. Because obviously, with biopics, a lot of the times, they're just trying to make a good movie. So you've got to have that set up with you have your protagonist, you have your your villains, per se. But in real life, oftentimes, these lines can, can blur. One of the best examples, in my opinion, would be the social network. You're following the Mark Zuckerberg character around, but also know that he's a huge asshole. But at the same time, you're hoping he actually wins over the Winklevoss brothers and Divi and Narendra. But then obviously you're super upset with what he does to Eduardo and you want the best for Eduardo. Like Sean Parker can say that he loves the social network all he wants because, you know, it's a fantastic movie. But even he can say that most of it's fiction and clearly wouldn't be happy with the fact that he's portrayed as a drug addict that likes hanging around barely legal interns. How old were they, Sean? Oh. It's not polite to ask. Sean, how old were they? You know, with an intern. No, it's cool. I have it under control. I will get it under control. And this is something you see time and time again. Last year's actual Academy Award Best Picture somehow winner, The Green Book, was immediately being contended by the family of Donald Shirley as the whole story being a fabrication. And again, that one actually won the Academy Award for Best Picture. More recently, with movies like Bombshell, you have Megyn Kelly with a wide level of comments on her portrayal and some of the inaccurate moments in the film, and more so lending to the fact that they had no control over over how their story was told. And this is kind of something that's happened in a couple different ways, both with this movie and, uh, and a miniseries that was done kind of revolving around the same story. They have no ability to kind of weigh in on a lot of this stuff. And while some of the stuff they acknowledge was handled really well and that they like how something was handled, there's also other areas where there are problems. I'll actually have something linked down below. Megan Kelly actually released a video talking with some of the, uh, the real life people from that story and their perspective on things. It's definitely worth watching. It's very surreal to see a story that involves you be told without you being able to tell it. Um, and things, they got a lot of right, but they got a lot kind of, not wrong. It took this, liberties. This was a, for Bombshell, it was, it was worse than, than that. Um, so that was my immediate takeaway. It was like, oh, this is it. Like, wow, you really let Roger off? Easy. Now, even though I just mentioned some situations where no lawsuits seem to be occurring around a biopic, this obviously isn't the first time studios have been sued for how they portray different characters in real life events. Back in 2017, a Leonard Skinner movie was banned, which kind of called into question the future of biopics and journalistic based movies in general. Also in 2017, a judge ended up tossing out a long standing lawsuit against the Janis Joplin biopic. And then going back even further, there was a lawsuit from Jodie Tyne against the movie uh, Perfect Storm, in which George Clooney portrayed her husband who had died at Storm. Mrs. Tyne took huge issues with the movie because it kind of displayed her husband as someone who had no idea what he was doing at sea rather than somebody who just tragically lost his life. And then as recently as September 25th, 2019, Lee Daniels was ordered to pay Damon Dash $1.7 million in the Richard Pryor biopic lawsuit. There's literally entire articles about tips and tricks on how to avoid defamation lawsuits when you're making a biopic. These are just some of the controversies that all biopics face. So is there a chance that the studios backed off on their campaign run for Hustlers because of this lawsuit getting a little bit more traction in the public eye? Or is it just some good old fashioned Oscar snubbing? Who knows, but I will say there's something interesting about the fact that the movie about Hustlers hustled the Hustlers. This city, this whole country is a strip club. You got people tossing the money and people doing the dance. So that is going to do it for today's video. Let me know what you guys are thinking in the comment section down below. What did you think of Hustlers the movie? I know while not as quality as The Wolf of Wall Street, a lot of people are saying that it's kind of like the female version of The Wolf of Wall Street. Well, I don't think she'll ever see every single copy of Hustlers pulled and, and stopped from distribution. She might have a chance for some other kind of damages and payouts from that. I feel like this might just be something they end up settling with her just to kind of quell the whole thing. But again, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know. Maybe she literally has no legal grounds to stand on. But I think the fact that they at least reached out to try to pay for the story shows that they knew that they kind of had to. And then the fact that they changed the character names make it seem a little bit, you know, more like they were trying to get around having to pay her money. I don't know. Again, I'm not a lawyer. Otherwise, what were some of your guys' favorite things to see at this year's Oscar nominations? I know I was really happy to see uh, Parasite getting nominated in so many different categories. 
So yeah, let me know what you guys are thinking down below. Again, thank you all so much for subscribing. Uh, we just hit like 50K on like the 29th of December and we are rounding the corner to 60K, which is absolutely incredible. Uh, thank you guys so much for the love and support and just continuing to watch uh, my, my video. So if you did like this video, feel free to leave it a like if you're into that kind of thing. Subscribe if you're new and are down for more content. All my social media is Amanda the Jedi, so you can find me from Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, all these different places. But yeah, thank you all so much for watching. Have a fantastic day and we'll catch you all later.